Hello and welcome to the Union News Podcast. Yes, hello, welcome to the Union News Podcast, the UK's only all things union programme. Produced for your downloadable digital delight and overall appreciation. We kick off our second series with an exclusive look at the league table of trade union websites with our special guest, Simon Parrott, plus a roundup of all the best union news from while we've been away. Hello, hello, welcome to the Union Dues podcast, the UK's only all things union show. I'm Simon Sapper, and this is the very first episode of our second series. Coming up, we'll hear from our special guest, Simon Parry, and exclusively reveal the 2020 league table of union websites. Simon and I will also chat about his role as the TUC's chief information officer, why office-based servers are a recipe for risk, the threat posed by ignorance about data laws, and why happiness lies in search engine optimization. All that's still to come. But we've been away over the summer. What's been going on? COVID, of course, continues to dominate. A public health emergency has been joined, as uh, all those with a brain in their head predicted, by an unemployment nightmare. Three quarters of a million people lost their jobs now due to the virus, and that's still rising and rising fast. The TUC has called for a job-centred recovery plan and the government has responded with a youth employment Kickstarter initiative. Uh, They say half a loaf is better than no loaf. Well, that's some bread and it's certainly better than no bread at all there. COVID really does leave little room for other news, but unions continue to be name-checked and consultation over public policy has probably, probably been higher now than for some years. Uh, which kind of isn't saying much given what's happened over the last 10 years, but you have to take the positives where you find them. But it really is a long, long way from being a change of tack by government. Only last week, new arrangements for trade advisory groups were described by Francis O'Grady as meaning a lesser role for unions. And the FDA is right and relentless at pointing out how their members are taking the blame for political decisions and every sympathy from me to my old students' union colleague, Jonathan Slater, as the DfE permanent secretary becomes the latest example of that. We have a clutch of new unions emerging, the Creator Union, the Gaming Workers Union and the Union Workers Union, all very different, but all encouraging signs of a thirst and appetite for collective voice and unionisation. And you can find links to their sites in the companion blog to this podcast, all growing and putting down roots in the current difficult circumstances. We have new General Secretary at Equity. Congratulations to Paul Fleming. It will be interesting to see how his organising background shapes the leadership of, of that union. And soon, as most of you will be aware, we'll have new General Secretaries at our three largest unions, Unite, Unison and GMB, all having new leaders in the foreseeable future. So it's a time of great change, great potential, great risk as well, I suppose, uh, for our movement. And we'll be discussing this as we go through the episodes in this series. Now, COVID or not, the short-sightedness and obstinacy of some employers still prevails. Congratulations to the IWGB union for a third successive victory against City Sprint. The courier firm said that the people who ride for them weren't entitled to holiday pay. The union took them to court. The court agreed with the union. They're now entitled to holiday pay. Come on, City Sprint, wake up, smell the coffee, act sensibly, please. And communications giant BT seems to have lost the plot big time, pressing ahead with plans for compulsory redundancies. The CWU has responded energetically and effectively. If you search for the count me in hashtag, you'll see a really impressive performance uh, by the union against some frankly gobsmacking moves by the employer. Good luck to the union on that one. Finally, an unwelcome first... For the first time since the COVID outbreak, members of the National Union journalists are taking strike action. These are the members at Bullivant Media who provide free titles across many of the towns and cities in the Midlands. They voted unanimously to take industrial action following a a tumultuous period 
over the last six months where they, they're they being paid at barely more than the national minimum wage anyway. They were being paid late. Then they had to take second jobs, many of them during the COVID crisis in order to, to pay their bills. Then the proprietors say we're going to have a mixture of compulsory and voluntary redundancies. Then they try and bring in non-journalists to do the work of the journalists. Quality goes down the chute, as you could, as you could expect. So eventually things got so bad that, as I say, the members voted unanimously to take industrial action. You can send a message of support to them at campaigns at nuj.org.uk. The message to Boulevard has to be sit down and talk to your staff, work collectively to find a solution to whatever problems you think you've got. It is not rocket science. And now our special guest, Simon Perry, has had a long, effective and innovant life in how unions use IT. He also brought us the union website League Table, the 2020 version of which is premiered for you now. Simon, the... The mind behind Infobo and the TUC's Chief Information Officer, very much welcome to the Union Juice podcast. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Simon. I mean, we meet at an exciting time in the, in the Infobo calendar anyway, because you are just about to publish the league table of trade union websites. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I've been doing it every year now since uh, 2012, and... Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I was basically going along the idea, I was trying to write the kind of blogs I would like to read when I was in my old position, where I'm looking at kind of comparisons and analytics. So it's usually one that provokes quite a bit of interest. And, and, and what, what contributes to a union's position on the league table of, their, of, of websites? What goes into the mix? It's not judging the quality of the actual site as such. What it's doing is trying to gauge how influential a website is seen on the internet. So it's using search engine optimization metrics to see how often a website is mentioned. It could be via social media, uh, links, and the quality of the quality of the mention as well. So, for example, if you're mentioned on the BBC website, it's worth far more than a small blog where nobody reads kind of thing. So what I'm using is a metric that scans the internet, tries to see how often these websites are mentioned, and then it gives them the score. It's mostly used in the commercial sector for companies trying to see how well their website will rank against competitors. But I thought it'd be really interesting when I first did this to do a comparison of the union websites, all the TC affiliated unions, to see where they appear and where they rank. And that way you can track your own website to see how often it's been mentioned over time yeah well i I, mean, I i get the importance of that it's not just a, a vanity thing it really it really does matter in terms of how effective you are at getting your message out there how the outside world regards you and and in some cases i suppose even for for marketization you know i mean if you can say i'm top of the trade union league table lots of people see our see our website now service provider do you want to enter a partnership with, with us it's you're going to have much more leverage i suppose the americans would call it so i so, don't keep us in suspense any longer. Can, can, can you understand the top 10 from 10 to 1? Right. Okay. So There, there, should, be, there should be that top 40 music going on in the background during, during this. But anyway. <laughs> well, there's no change at the top. It's uh, the, the BDA in, uh, are at the top of the table again, uh, followed by Unite, the, the CSP, uh, Unison and Third. Uh, they were fourth last year, uh, but they moved up to joint third with the CSP. In fifth place is the RCM, Royal College of Midwives. The NUJ stay in sixth. The GMB move up, uh, move down one position from sixth to seventh. Uh, UCU move from eighth to joint seventh. The PFA stay in number nine. And Balpa have made a top ten up to tenth. So, so if, my, if, if my maths is, is right, or my, my, my historical recollection is right, that, I mean, that, that's... But Balpa are one of the, the biggest risers then, aren't they? In there? I think that... Um, so, so a good year, a good year for them. Yeah, uh, it's most notable this year. There's been less change. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that. I mean, the the the, the top kind of like the top six, as it were, are, are are pretty much the same as as last year. I, I, that's that's quite unusual, isn't it? Yeah, I think this is one of the most static years I've seen doing this. Interestingly, as well, the biggest riser is the the NEU, which is uh, to be expected because previously. 
the the two unions that made the NEU were doing quite well, and you know particularly the NET were always quite high up in this table. So the fact that they dropped their existing sites and they've now they now won the new union. Uh, I'm expecting them to keep on going up until eventually they're getting into the top 10 because uh, it takes time to build up your domain authority, to build up links and that kind of thing. But with the other the other two risers, the TSSA have moved up seven positions. They're now, um, they're now up to 19th from 26th. Um, Balpa have moved up third. I would say there's a good chance the reason those two have moved up is because there's more news coverage around travel with COVID. So we see this often. Sometimes it reacts around, uh, yeah, a, a few years ago, the Fire Brigade Union did very well because they had a very strong campaign going against cuts. So they're getting a lot of uh, a lot of coverage. We see um, the RMT do well when the, the the rail coverage as well. So I think you can explain the TSSA and the Balpa in the in the news context context and the NEU. But there's no no big surprises this year. So, so from 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 what you from what you're saying, if you are if you're one of the more lowly ranked trade union websites, and you think oh, I need to break, I need to get into Europe next season, I need to get into the top six, or um, then then you're going to. There's actually only so much you yourself can do because I, actually, if you if you have if you've ironically, I suppose if you've been successful as a trade union and you have a period of industrial relations peace and calm and tranquil tranquility it's not going to be newsworthy and therefore that's you're not that's not going to enhance your website score well there are things you can do what you tend to see you have to look at it over the years rather than year by year so for example the gmb when i first started doing this they were uh, 18th and they you know considering the size of the gmb they weren't the metrics weren't very high mm-hmm. and I've noticed they've been going up steadily over the years and they've been doing lots of work you know, sort of on their on their comm side and trying to make sure that they get, they get a strong message. So you do see slow rises over time with some unions getting there. Interestingly, the unions also act as a kind of professional body. They've always done well. So the CSP, the BDA have always done well in those kind of things. So they pack more of a punch, often because they're referred to not just because of the news that you're doing as a union, yes. but because they have some authoritative guide on you know, sort of back pain or something like this as well. So we get lots of quality links. It's interesting. Well, uni- unions that work in the media have always done well in this because they work in the media. They're good at using the media. They get more coverage. So equity will have lots of famous members who will mention them in social media on their websites and so forth. So you do see some trends over time. I have been thinking about doing a, a kind of a, a metagraph going back for the whole kind of eight years of it. Oh, yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, obviously, some means have come in, have gone out, but that would um, give a nice historical context to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. No, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'm very geeky on stuff like this. So, so yeah, I think that's fun. Other people might think it's dry as toast. But where, where and when will people be able to see the full league table? Well, I'm publishing it uh, probably by the time this podcast goes out, which I believe is early September. It will be on the website at infobo.com. Great, great. Thank you very much. And this is not the only league table that, that you compile, is it? I think there's one on, is there one on social media presence as well that comes out later in the year. Yeah, I usually do that one in November every year. And it's really looking at Twitter. It's very hard to measure the metrics for Facebook on so many other ones. Twitter's a very open platform. So I'm looking at how influential the, the social media accounts for unions are every year. And it's kind of ties in nicely with the kind of end of year, year metrics. All oh, right. Okay. So that so that's that's kind of November December time. Great. Okay. Well, I mean, moving on to to some of the other stuff you, you do. Um, as I mentioned at the in the introduction, you you know you're the TUC's chief information officer. I think you're the first TUC's CIO, aren't you? What does that role involve? Well, I've been doing it now since 2016. It's almost four years anniversary, uh, and I was brought in to try to to help guide future strategy and to help bring sort of communications and help the organisations sort of uh, work together to advance its strategy. So what I've really been sort of uh, focused on a lot of the last few years is the the kind of moving the infrastructure into sort of next generation infrastructure, you know, infrastructure as a service, kind of more use of cloud, less reliance on internal servers. You know, we, we've migrated to Microsoft 365 and we're using a lot of those kind of facilities, which in the context of COVID, have been, uh, has been very useful. 
Well, it's, it's almost like the, the ultimate stress test. I think I've described it on other episodes of the podcast. The ultimate stress test for unions IT capacity is has been the COVID pa- pandemic. Uh, and I, I remember John Wood, who the TUC's kind of digital guru in, in many ways, um, who, who spoke to us in our last series saying, fortunately, the TUC had completed virtually all of that migration before COVID hit, because otherwise it would have been very much harder to, to continue operating. Yeah, I mean, the, the final piece of the jigsaw was one of the hardest was moving to SharePoint, which had, uh, had been a kind of uh, multi-year project, which uh, the team working at been working really hard and had just finished it in February. So the timing for that was very useful because it meant, you know, we built the, the, we built it, the infrastructure around the fact that you could work anywhere remotely. We hadn't expected it to be quite so in demand so early on. So as soon as it was finished, we were basically able to work remotely from home without any bottlenecks anywhere, no bottlenecks to do with the WAN, that side of things as well. So that was very, very useful because obviously the easier we can make it for staff at the moment, the better. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, it, once uh, unions have, have migrated to the cloud and have weaned themselves off reliance on, in, on, on internal servers, uh, what's the, what are the remaining, I mean, that's a huge step, step forward, but that's not the only challenge in this space, is it? No, no. I mean, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges at the moment is data protection for unions, particularly GDPR, the post-GDPR. Obviously, the TEC, the affiliate body, but if I was working for a union, I I used to work for uh, Prospect. If I was working for union now, that would be one of the the big challenges you got because really you need to be controlling the personal data, the sensitive data. You need to be having it on, on union applications cloud applications and you need to move away from having personal data stored on local machines and kind of private stores that's i'd say is one of the biggest challenges unions are facing in that area well i mean that's that's a really that that really is a tricky one isn't it because because of course the building blocks of unions are, are branches and branches need to be able to manage the data of the members in that branch in order to to inform support mobilize and, and so on but i suppose even if even if a branch membership database is mirrored by the union centrally, that doesn't that doesn't alleviate the risk, does it? Because there's still, in theory, the opportunity for unlawful processing of the data at the branch end. Therefore, it is it, you know there is a real legal imperative for central and unique central control. Yeah, it's really tricky because you know, obviously the reps are the backbone of any union. But yeah, you know, at the same time now, there's there's more of an emphasis on the training side and making sure data is used correctly because th- there's quite a lot of legal risks. So getting an infrastructure in place, um, obviously moving to the cloud and stuff is a big challenge in itself, but it does give you the advantage of making it easier to give more useful tools for the active members and to give them the facilities to store data securely. So if there's turnover in branches and stuff, it's really around things like personal cases as well as just sort of the, the membership data. It's making sure that that personal case sensitive data is kept in a in an appropriate place. So it sounds like as well as charting a kind of strategic way forward for the TUC, your role is also to identify risk and identify best practice as well amongst uh, uh, affiliates. Yeah, to, well, to, to, to some degree, yeah. I mean, I'd like to probably spend more time doing that. I've spent a lot of time sort of in, on internal things over the last few years. But we, we have published a new version of the Digital Health Check earlier this year, which uh, I updated, which uh, is designed for unions to sort of download. And it takes a couple of hours to go through, but then it gives you kind of metrics of where your union is with regards to uh, various sides of digital and tech. So... You, you can find that on the digital TUC site, digital.tuc.org.uk, uh, but that's a very useful tool. I also write a regular monthly article in Labour Research magazine and do the odd feature for LRD. So I did that. I did, I did a piece of highlighting data protection risks with, within the magazine as well. So, yeah, I would like to do a bit more of that, uh, that kind of thing going forward, really. Well, yeah, I mean, I, regular listeners will know that that uh, I'm a big fan of the Labour Research Department, and I certainly do read your column every month, every month, Simon. It's a, it's a really good, important contribution there. I suppose TUC and, and League Tables aside, actually, we, we're coming up to the the tenth anniversary of your company in Fobo. Um, that must give. I mean, you must be 
pleased with that. I mean, the, the, you, you, there's still no one else quite like Infobo in terms of the stuff you do and the you know the results that you contribute to amongst unions. So you know you must have seen some some changes over the ten years. And but of course you were involved in the movement in, in the IT space long before you set up Infobo. If it's if it's not too much of an open question, what what are your reflections on how things have changed? What was the sort of stuff you were doing to, that you're starting with and you look back and you think, yeah, I was ahead of the curve on that one or no, actually that was a bit of a dead end. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I guess sort of showing my age, I've, I've, I've worked on quite a few, quite a few interesting things over the years. But when I first um, started working in the movement in the late 90s for the Engineers and Managers Association, I just finished a master's in information science and uh, I was given quite a free reign on the whole website side of things because there really wasn't much knowledge of how that side of things works. So within a few months, the general secretary there, Tony Cooper, had put me in charge of that side of it. So we did a lot of innovation around, we built the first member website that allowed members to view and update their details online. Whoa, whoa, heretical. You can't, you can't you tell, oh, you'd never get away with that. People see, I was amazed say. how controversial it was at the time. It was, um, you know, when we eventually merged you know, Fuse Down Line into Prospect, it was, I remember some former, some former colleagues very shocked that we allowed members to change details online. Uh, we built the first virtual branch system, something that's used quite a lot now by people like Unison and Prospect, obviously been doing it for years. But the very first one I did was while I was at the EMA, came out for a very practical reason because we had lots of members based in, China and Pakistan, who were working for an international power company, who couldn't actually meet their their official. So we set up uh, a system which was built into the website where they could log in and they could have uh, online Java sort of chats with the official at, at pre-designated times, and they could disseminate documents to the branch. Uh, and that was really interesting because it proved popular. And then we involved it at Prospect into the e-branch system, which has been been uh, used now for you know uh, probably best part of two decades it's been uh, kind of on the go and it won the tc award and it's launching and since then obviously a lot of unions have gone down a similar path so that was satisfying i can remember working on what was the second ever full online joining system i wanted to have the first but i was picked by connect uh, by three months because we were waiting <laughs> we were waiting for our, our membership system at prospect to be out as compatible and uh, i worked on one of the first ever responsive mobile friendly trading websites which was uh, for the then building union ucat even the apprenticeship, uh, the apprenticeship app prospect developed back in 2013. That was one of the first union apps. Yes, indeed it was. Yeah, um, which yeah, which is now shut. But we, I was, that did very well. It had over 40,000 downloads by the time it shut down. It wow. was built on a shoestring budget, and I was particularly pleased with the way it outranked the official uh, apprenticeship vacancies app because uh, the the people the people who made it didn't understand anything about app store optimization so they gave it a, a crazy name where we named ours what it did on the tin apprenticeship jobs mm. and guide so if you typed in apprenticeship jobs apprenticeship guidance the prospect app was appearing right at the top so so yeah so i'm, I'm still doing things at the moment obviously there's been a lot of changes I've, I've seen some things which have been more dead ends i'm guessing the probably best example would be second life the tcs of the union island i don't know i don't even remember that one, Simon? Oh, that's ringing some bells. Yes. Yeah. My, I, I, I buried that one deep in my mind. Um, but yeah. But yeah, like, yeah, like of all good things to tech, you've got to try things out and you've got to take the, the yeah, the, you've got to make sure that you're willing to accept a, a number of failures. Yeah. Well, no, no pain, no gain, as they, uh, as they say. If you were able to look forward two or three years down the track, what do you think? What, what, what do you hope you would have seen during that period of time in terms of unions understanding and use of, of IT? That's a good question. Um, I think there's still a, lot of, uh, still a lot of catching up going on. Some unions, to be fair, are doing really good jobs and, and quite ahead of the curve. But the, the, the whole movement to infrastructure as a service is quite a painful one for a lot of organisations. If you were a new organisation, it'd be very easy. You wouldn't set up in a kind of a legacy way. But that whole process of making sure you get the value for money from the servers you invested in, migrating it. So I'd expect to see more movement that side. Uh, that would increase, increase resilience and reduce costs for a lot of unions as well. Uh, with the website side of things and apps, it's an interesting one. Uh, uh, one of the big sort of hidden changes is the semantic web and seeing how that's sort of taking over. So you're putting markup in websites to make sure 
the information on the website can be read easily. So, for example, tying in with things like voice assistants, so uh, Echo and Google Assistant, so forth. So the idea is you can ask a question and the website's written in a way where it can be read and uh, understood. One thing I do keep on sort of banging on about is the search engine optimization side. I, I've worked with, you know, I, I work with the private sector and I work with unions since I've founded Infobo. Um, the biggest difference in demand on the website of things is search engine optimization or SEO, as it's, as it's called. Yeah. For uh, a business, it's about the sales and getting services in. Yeah, for one retailer I work with, it's absolutely key for the business. With unions, it's often something they don't understand. And one of the key things unions are trying to do is influence people. If you want somebody typing in about pay for a certain sector of worker, you want the union message to appear high up in Google. And this can be done, you know, some comparatively cheap and quick fixes to website can make a big difference because unions often have good authoritative websites, get a lot of good mentions because they got lots of you know, sort of uh, their branches mentioning them, press coverage outside of it. And a few changes can make a big difference in if you're going to appear in number number one, two or three in Google, or if you're going to appear on page two. But it's crucial, isn't it? You, you know, if people, if people type in union, the first thing you want to come up is the TUC, say, or Unite or Unison or what, whatever. Mm-hmm. You don't want to have to scroll through two or three or more pages to get to the, the stuff that you want you want focused on. So, yeah, I mean, you know, SEO is, is at best an opaque art, um, but my goodness, it's uh, it's certainly important. It makes a real a real difference. Yeah. Well, mm. you, you, well, you, yeah, you, I think with the voice assistants as well, you want you want to be able to ask a question and hopefully get to the point where the union message is the authoritative message. And things like joining union, you want to be able to say, you know, join X union and you want that page to appear high up. So if that's one thing I do sort of uh, talk about, I, th- I think data protection is probably one of the other ones is making sure those changes are put in place to make the uh, to make the most, well, to reduce risks and to make the most of the new technology around data protection and to make sure sort of best practice is put in place. So you know, we're, we're dealing with our members the way private sector company would deal on the security of their uh, of their customers, even though, <laughs> to be fair, there's a lot of private <laughs> private sector companies have done a bad job of that. But you know, getting to that kind of level of professionalism as well as offering those services. You know, a, a line I've heard I've heard a number of times is, is is actually the what we're seeking is for trade union websites to be as slick and seamless and as safe as say your bank's website. I mean, which yeah. suppose you say that's not, that's not necessarily the best comparator <laughs> always, but but I you know I get what's being said with that. So, Simon, it's been it's been uh, great to have you on. I mean, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for sharing your insights with us and the Union Juice audience, and uh, and the very best of luck going forward. Thanks, thanks for having me, Simon. I hope you enjoyed that. If you agree or disagree with anything Simon said, let us know. Email us at unionjews at makesyouthink.com. Tweet us at Jews Union. Is SEO the road to digital happiness or just a gimmick? Do you think that Union Island was actually the best thing since sliced bread and should be brought back to life? Hmm, who knows? If you want to take a closer look at those leading websites, the BDA, that's the British Dietetic Association, by the way, not the British Dental Association, they're at www.bda.uk.org. Unite are at www.unitetheunion.org. CSP is www.csp.org.uk. And Unison is www.unison.org.uk. And if you want to look at the full lead table or get in touch with Simon directly, head over to www dot infobo dot com now i know you all want to know what's coming up on union jews this series and it's all good stuff i promise we've got some great guests unique insights histories and experiences so we'll hear from jamie briars of equity on organizing in the fashion industry particularly catwalk and other models Roseanne Foyer and shavana taj general secretaries respectively of the scottish and wales tucs will join us Global expert on the future of work, Christina Colclough, and Unions 21 Executive Director, Becky Wright, will challenge us to think outside the box. We'll have a special episode on why freelancers have a new appetite for unionism and what we can do about it. And I'll be delighted to welcome New Zealand TUC General Secretary, Melissa Ansel Bridges, shortly after the Kiwi general election, to discuss what the result means for unions there.
There's more to come, and I'll keep you up to date on each episode. You can also follow us on Twitter at Jews Union, follow us on Facebook, search for Simon MYT, and register for updates on the podcasting platform of your choice. Next time out, I'll be chatting with Doug Nichols, General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions, the GTFU, 26 affiliates and over 120 years of history. Not sure who they are or what they do? You'll be both surprised and delighted. That episode drops on the 8th of September. Don't miss it. Well, that's about it for this time. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. And thanks very much for your company this last half hour or so. If you'd like to get in touch, don't forget the email is unionjews at makesyouthink.com. You can say hello on Twitter at Jews Union. A shout out before we go to my fellow podcasters in the Labour Radio Podcast Network. You can access Union Jews and 63 other union related podcasts through www.labourradionetwork or one word dot org. And it's Labour the way the Americans spell it without the U. And an even bigger shout out to everyone affected by the start of the new school year. Although I know it's been up and running already in Scotland and Northern Ireland and just yesterday in Wales. A huge challenge for teaching and non-teaching staff, students of all ages and the families of all of these. Education unions have played a blinder on this and I'm happy to continue to look to them for guidance. Till next time, stay safe everyone and see you around. The Union Dues podcast is presented by me, Simon Sapper. It is a Makes You Think production.